Look at this, big old group of people here. Huh? So we begin our Easter series right now. We're going to spend three weeks, and we've titled the message, Victory in Jesus. We're going to unpack together the things by which Jesus has done for us, the victory that he has brought to us as believers. So with that, we're going to begin to spend some time in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 54, as sort of our series theme in the Word of God. Today, we're going to talk about the law. Next week, we talk about sin, everybody's favorite topic, and then on Easter morning, we're going to engage in a morbid conversation about death. So I hope that you'll bring all your friends and tell them how exciting it will be that they'll get to learn about the end of themselves, right? So we got this series together, three weeks, victory in Jesus, beginning right now. Let's pray and receive God's word. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for the fact that you are here. Lord, help us to bring pleasure to you as we've gathered to hear from you. Help us to honor you and praise you and just glory in the fact that you love us and we can love you in return. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 54 says this. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with the immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, let's unpack this now. The law. Let's talk about the law and let's talk about the gospel. One of the things that the old-timey preachers knew very well, those old-school, amazing, old-time, fiery preachers of the past, you know, I'm talking about the John Wesleys and the George Whitfields and all these amazing movements and the Charles Finneys and so many others. One, th one thing they understood so well that has perhaps been almost lost today is no one's ready to receive the gospel until they know they violated the law. And so I want us to unpack today the contrast between law and gospel, right? If you've ever wondered, if you've ever wondered why your friends don't seem to be nearly as intrigued with Jesus as you are, you're going to find out today. So let's look at the first thing, the law, the purpose of the law. There is so much confusion, even in our day and age, the purpose, and I'm talking about God's law, the purpose of law. So let's look at some of the things that the law does. First one, it reveals the character of a holy and righteous God. I mean, we wouldn't even know what moral purity is apart from God revealing it to us. In fact, we have this funny notion we can get together and just vote on what is morally pure, and because we voted, that makes it right right? In fact, God's law shows us God's character. You see, God doesn't steal from us. God doesn't murder. When God kills, it is holy, righteous, and just. Let that hit our modern mind, right? And then when we realize that God doesn't covet anything, that God is not powerless, he's all-powerful. When you look to the law, you see the holiness of God. And then we see ourselves. One of the purposes of the law is to reveal God. The next is to be a protection against the sinful nature of fallen mankind. Let me illustrate this using someone else's illustration. The law helps to protect a little bit like putting a fence around a playground. So think about it. Maybe you knew this growing up as a kid. I don't remember any fences around the school I played in. We'd play kickball. The ball would roll in the street. We'd just run right into traffic and get our ball back. And, you know, it's fine. It's amazing nobody got killed. But if you don't have a fence, eventually a child's going to run into the fence to retrieve a softball, baseball, kickball, and smack, a car's going to hit that little kid. So they put fences around the playground. The fences are not to restrict the freedom of the kids, but rather to protect them. So it's a little bit like what the law is for a fallen mankind. It's to constrain and protect. You see, anything within the fence, you're free to do. You're free to play and have fun and enjoy all there is. But sadly, once there's a fence, we run to the edges of it, don't we? Oh, look, a fence. We can play anywhere in this quarter mile of grass, but we're going to hang around the chain link fence, right? Because it's cool or something. But the reality is the law often protect us, protects us in that way. 
Let me illustrate another one that's often confused. <laughs> Have you ever heard an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth? Well, in our current age, in movies and Hollywood shows, they turn that into something else. They turn an eye and an eye, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, into the Chicago way. You stab one of mine, I'm going to stab ten of yours. You shoot one of mine, I'm going to shoot all of yours. They turn that into some kind of rampant, amazing, ravaging revenge. An eye for an eye. What was the purpose of that passage? It was actually to constrain violence. It was to make the punishment fit the crime. It was to prevent revenge and stick to retribution, which is the demonstration of the law. So we, can, we are confused on this issue. So the first one reveals a holy, righteous God. Second one protects against the sinful nature. This is the one that you're probably most aware of. And the New Testament tells us this is one of the most significant purpose of the law today. It is to be a mirror for your soul. It is to show you your need for Christ. So I was alluding to it earlier. When we come to the law of God, we are suddenly encountering something that is righteous and truly pure. Oftentimes what that does for us, it shows us in what ways that we are not. So the purpose of the law was to bring us to Christ, to demonstrate God's holiness and his grace and to protect humanity until the Messiah could come. So imagine the absurdity of still living under a set of rules or turning to rules to achieve holiness. It's not possible. In Jesus' day, he was the most uh, strong against religiosity or the practice of religious things, assuming that makes you right. It does not. The law was never intended to do that for anyone. So let me unpack it some more. The law does not pardon. It only punishes. The law is lifeless. It cannot pardon you. It can only punish you, right? It can only produce a penalty. The law provides no comfort for a lawbreaker. Could you imagine? It doesn't. The law cannot transform human nature. It has no power to change you. Just because there's a rule doesn't actually give you the power to live up to that rule. There's where we begin to see part of the problem. It can only constrain, it can only protect, and it can only punish. The written law doesn't protect, or excuse me, doesn't produce anything, it only protects. The written law cannot produce love, right? It can only regulate and punish, it can set boundaries and define error, but the law cannot give life, the law cannot create love, it can only point the way, and that way is to Christ. So think about it. The law doesn't produce love. Notice that? The, the law doesn't produce kindness and gentleness and courtesy. Let me prove it to you using human law. You ready? Let's take the speed limit law for a minute. Have you ever noticed how the speed limit law produces such gentleness amongst drivers? Have you, have you ever noticed the speed limit law produces such kindness and love and such courtesy to one another? Does it do that? In fact, the very fact that there's a speed limit law seems to produce the opposite. Isn't that interesting? Let me illustrate a little bit more. So if you're driving too slow, they're mad. If you're driving too fast, they're mad. If you have the audacity to drive the speed limit, they're really mad. So the speed limit law cannot provide the love, courtesy, respect, or anything else. All it does is protect, if anyone follows it, and provide a penalty if you don't. Do you see that? So that's human law. So when we come to God's law, we need to understand the power of it. Listen, the law. The law crushes transgressors. The law of God crushes. I mean, the law of God is a dagger to the soul of fallen mankind. It provides no comfort, no, no, no consolement, nothing. The law slays absolutely 100% all the time. You cannot achieve righteousness by attempting the law. You can't do it. This is part of the problem that has existed for the church for so long. They think they follow rules and somehow that makes them right. That cannot make you right. Never. So we get to this package and we realize that God is giving us something very important to understand. That the law was designed to bring us to Christ. To show us our need. Let me go to a very powerful scripture. It's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I think we'll have it up on the screen for you. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. It's talking about God. He made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, 
but the Spirit gives life. You see, the law, the letter of the law can't give you the power to fulfill it. The Spirit can come and empower you, but the letter of the law will slay you every time. It'll show you where you don't stack up, right? The law provides no comfort. In fact, get this, just like the speed limit often does not produce the desired result we would like. In fact, road rage and anger and annoyance and frustration tend to be the uh, issue of the day. The law of God can stir within us feelings of failure. One of the things I hear a lot when I counsel people, and I, I'm still doing some counseling of those that are not in the church. My, because we have a growing, thriving church, I'm trying to limit myself to the flock. But in reality, I'm trying to reach the lost too. But it's a tough thing to do, okay? Because I'm a limited person. I only have so much time. But when I spend time with those who are not in church, it's interesting that often they bring up, well, I've been meaning to come to church and I've been thinking about for three years, one person once told me. Three years? What has held you back? You know what's funny? They don't feel worthy to come into this room. What has happened by which they don't feel they can come into this room or any room like it until they've gotten their life better? So, so, so the gospel means you get your life cleaned up so that you can get good enough to come and approach God's grace. Something's wrong, and who communicates this to them? How are they learning this? So part of it is the law. It produces a sense of failure. It produces a sense of powerlessness, that you're not good enough, uh, that you're defeated, that you're rejected, that you're not worthy. Often the law makes us feel as if we're not worthy. We're not moral enough. I can't do this in my own strength. I can't do this at all. Consider this. Have you ever had those moments where you know you don't measure up? You know. I'm talking about somebody else's opinion or somebody else. You've come to the place, what we say is the end of yourself. I can tell you that is one of the most liberating things that can ever happen. See, I found out when I came to the end of myself, it wasn't even God's standards that brought me there. Huh. I couldn't even live up to the standards of my own morality. How scary is that? And so as we realize there's those times that we come to the end of ourselves, we begin to understand what the law has done. The law has slayed us. Now get this. When you've gotten there, you're ready to receive the gospel. If you haven't gotten there, you think you don't need the gospel. So I mentioned to you why your friends, you know, you come to your friends and they go, oh, I'm glad you found Jesus. You really needed something in your life. I'm glad you've come to Jesus. I'm glad that you're fascinated by that, but spare me, please. But you say, wait a minute, but Jesus brings you peace. Hey, I'm peaceful. Jesus will bring you comfort. Oh, I'm very comfortable. You should see my car, my house, my, I'm comfortable. But Jesus is going to bring you joy. I've got joy. And then you're like, well, I don't know. It works for me. You just end a story. That's it. You see, they don't think they need Jesus. In fact, there's no gospel of real power in anyone's life until they know they need Jesus. That's the great irony of this all. Let me illustrate it to you this way. So if you ask a person, it doesn't matter, generally speaking, who you ask. I mean, it's wild. Are you a good person? Have you ever asked this question of people? What do you suppose the answer is, and surveys have shown this time and time again in 99% of the cases, what do people answer? Yes, I'm a good person. And they'll say, well, I've made a few mistakes. You know, I murdered my neighbor and stuffed him in a suitcase. But, you know, I'm serving time for that. Or people say, I'm a good person. What makes you a good person? Well, I haven't killed anybody. Well, whoop-de-doo, that's a great standard. So everyone believes that they're okay based on the good person clause. There's a real problem with that. God's moral standards is not as low as humans' good person clause is. There's going to be a major gap there when we stand at the end of our lives before a holy and righteous God, and he says, why should you come into my eternal heaven prepared for those who love me? Whoa, so let's take a little journey down the road, okay? If someone says they're a good person, you say, well, how about we test that? Anyone here today want to take the uh, Ten Commandments challenge? You know, God's greatest hits. The 10 suggestions. So Ray Comfort does this really well, and that's what I love about Ray. He brings all kinds of different tools to the to table. He's a street preacher evangelist. So check it out. When you start to go through the 10 commandments, you immediately begin to recognize your need. Part of the problem with contemporary preaching is no one really gets to a place they know they need Jesus. And they're not really converted because they think they've added a little pinch of Jesus to their life. I'm just going to go to church, and I feel good about it, so it must be good. I'm going to follow some moral standards. Parents will often bring their kids into church because at least they'll learn good and bad. That's all lovely, but that's not going to help anybody. 
The truth is, when you come to the realization that you need God, then grace becomes astounding. Consider the first commandment. First commandment is you have the Lord your God, no other gods before him. You say, well, I don't worship Buddha. I don't worship other gods. Well, often we make ourselves an idol. Or we make wealth an idol or success an idol. We put all these things before the Lord our God and we think that God should be happy. We give him an hour a week or whatever. You know what I'm saying? It's funny. Let's take the third commandment, right? This is an interesting one. You're not to misuse the name of the Lord your God. Now, can I just tell you as your pastor, I know I'm going to horrify you. I apologize if this causes you some trauma. I can provide you free counseling. I have yet misused the name of Jesus Christ more times than I could possibly count. It was my favorite cuss word. I don't know why. I have no clue, except that that was my favorite. Now, when you consider that every single account is a capital crime, a capital crime, the penalty is death. Do you know how many times I'm under the death sentence by the misuse of the name of a holy, righteous God on the day of judgment? See, that's just one thing. Let's move forward. So then you move these other interesting commandments, and it says that you should not commit adultery. No problem. Hey, I'm a pretty good guy. Then Jesus comes along and just rocks my world. And he says, if you look at another person to lust after them in your heart, you've already committed adultery in your heart as far as God's concerned. You're already the kind of person who enjoys that perversion. You're already the kind of person that dabbles in that lust. As far as God is concerned, you've already done it? That's just crazy. Oh, here's a real fun one. So adultery is real interesting, but how about lying? You ever stolen anything? How about stealing? If you're a liar and you may not be telling me the truth about what you've stolen, right? You have all these little crazy things and they begin to add up to us and we realize this is an awesome God and we have violated his standards. So we've got all of these different things by which he tells us, right? Murder. Well, at least I haven't murdered anyone. Remember that? A little bit of a problem there. You see, Jesus says, and Jesus is God in the flesh, says that if you harbor hatred in your heart towards another I mean, you've murdered them in your heart. You're already the kind of person that would do something like that. The actual physical act is just a step away. In fact, that's a warning sign. That means now you can understand traffic a little better, right? It's a murderous place, baby. So when we come to this realization, when we just go through the Ten Commandments, we understand something that the old-timey preachers knew. No one's ready to receive Jesus until they know they need him. Wow. Did you know this? Did you understand this? Now do you get your atheist and agnostic friends? I mean, as far as you're just a freak show going to a freak circus because they don't need Jesus. They're like, I'm glad you have him, but I don't need him. The law was designed to show us our need. And when we understand our need, then we understand the teachings of Jesus. You see, blessed are the poor in spirit. It's sort of the portrait of someone once said as a roadside beggar who has had nothing to eat, who's perhaps one meal away from perishing, has no hope for the future. He's never going to have a change in his circumstances. Nothing is going to save him unless someone is merciful as they walk by. And that's the situation that we are in when we realize, apart from Christ, there's no hope for us. No one can pay the penalty for our transgressions. Our own blood's not going to save us. No amount of religious good deeds are going to save you. There is only one way by which humanity is saved, and this is the most offensive thing to our world today, but it is truth. And that one way is through the cross of Christ. The gospel has its power when you know you need it. The gospel becomes a victorious thing when you understand it. So this is Easter Caesars, Caesars, seasons, thank you. This Easter season, say that fast 10 times, we're going to explore what Christ does for us on the cross. The first thing he does is he gives us victory over the penalty of the law. Get this, if you've ever felt that you're not good enough, if you ever felt that you couldn't rise to the occasion, if you've ever been defeated by the reality of your own life and your own fallen nature at times, if you've ever felt that your past is too much to get over, that's where the cross speaks mercy over you and over me. And so I want to share with you as we talk about victory in Jesus, I want to share with you a quote that captures the stunning grace of God. Listen to this. I love this quote. So here's what it says. Ultimately, The gospel isn't about our moral performance. It's about the moral performance of Jesus on our behalf. You see, that's good news. If it's my moral performance, I'm doomed. I mean, if it's completely up to me in my life, and God is going to play back the tape of my life, 
How many times have I transgressed God's holy, righteous law? How many times have I insulted his character by the way I've acted? How many times have I taken his name in a nasty way when he died for me and shed his blood? Oh, I don't want to face that, Sean. And by the mercy of Jesus Christ, I don't have to. Do you see the difference? One world and understanding of Christianity is we're living up to a moral standard by our own effort. That's not Christianity. That's heresy. Christianity says we are living by a relationship to the one who has already done it for us. You see, Jesus Christ was born under the law, lived perfectly under the law, committed no sin, and that's why he's the perfect sacrifice. He went lovingly, demonstrating his love for you, and he gave his life. Why? You think, why did Jesus have to die? What's the point in this? It seems disgusting. We sing about blood, and it's nasty. It's not nasty when you know what's been accomplished. By the shedding of his blood, he took the penalty. You see, people think like God is just some big, doting old grandfather with a long beard. He's sort of like a mix between a sweet grandpa and Santa Claus. And he's just winking at everybody who sins. It's okay, I love you. It's okay, you're a nasty murderer. I'm just going to let you in my heaven because you sing good songs to me. It's okay because I've seen you at an 80% attendance rate at church. That gets you in. It's interesting that we sometimes have this way. And if not us, the world thinks that way. But here's what you need to know this Easter season. God does not wink at sin. He took the penalty on himself. He did not sweep everything we did that was bad and horrible and nasty under a carpet and wink and say, it's okay, I'll let you go anyway. He took it on himself. That's the meaning of mercy upon the cross is God says, I love you so much. I'm not going to leave you the way you are. I'm going to pay the penalty that would have been yours. So when you get to a holy, righteous God in heaven, he says, why should I let you in? You say, because I love you. And Jesus Christ's moral performance is what I lay claim to. Come on in. Wow. We begin to realize that faith is a relationship of trust. Trusting what God has done. So let's look at a verse. Talk about the triumph of the cross. Check this out. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. You say, if God's law is holy and righteous, why is it a curse? Because we can't live up to it. The sin nature that we're born with before we come to Christ just destroys our own life. Then we come to Christ, if we don't have his power, we can't live in his ways. So it's a curse. It's a burden. The law doesn't provide power. It only provides penalty. That's why it's a curse. So it says that Jesus became a curse for us. He says, no, I love you. I'm taking that. I've come to rescue humanity for anyone who trusts in me. I will take the punishment for you. Whoa. It's like you're sitting and someone once said, you're sitting in a courtroom. You've just been found guilty. I don't, you know, only idiots argue with the judge thinking it's going to get them off. I mean, that's just absurd, right? It generally adds charges, contempt. Da, 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 da. So you're standing in the courtroom. You realize that you've been found guilty. And just as the judge's gavel is coming down, you're going to go to death row. You're going to be on death sentence. Suddenly someone in the back of the courtroom steps in and says, I'll pay it. Shocked. Who's going to step up for this person, this immoral person, this nasty person, this liar, this thief, this adulterer, this blasphemer? Who's dare pay for his penalty? How is he worthy for that? And Jesus says, he's worthy because I love him. She's worthy because I love her. Whoa, you begin to realize there's something more powerful going on here than a religious system of rules. So it says, he's become a curse for us. Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. It's a way of saying everyone who is hung upon wood, killed that way. See, only thieves are killed that way. Only murderers are killed that way. God identified with a thief and a murderer for you. He says, I'm taking that burden, that label, everything in your past, all that you've ever done, all that you ever, any way you went wrong, I'm taking that on me. And I'm giving you a new reputation, a new relationship, and a new life. Not by your moral performance, but by mine. You see, when the gospel carries its original weight and power, people get saved. They get saved. We're not inviting anybody into a new religion. We're not inviting anybody into a new denomination. Sorry. We're not inviting anybody into a new religious system of rules. We're inviting them to know the one who loves them, Jesus Christ. That is compelling. So as we unpack it, it says, He redeemed us in order that the blessings given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles, that is anyone who's non-Jewish, through Christ Jesus so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Remember I said the law cannot produce the power to obey it? It's true. It only produces penalty. 
Guess what the Holy Spirit produces? <laughs> produces love and motivation. And you don't have to look to rules to figure it out. If you really love your neighbor, you're not coveting their stuff because that's not love. I don't have to go back to a rule to figure out how to love someone because Christ shows me and lives in me. You see, it's a tangible change of human nature. Now you can see why the world so much despises certain elements of Christianity where they have high moral standards that even they don't follow. But boy, they look down on the other ones that don't follow as well because they're not in the building they are. You begin to realize that Christianity, when the gospel is presented in the reality of what it is, it's powerful. Another verse I want to share with you, Romans 8. Romans 8, 3. Check this out. This is wild. For what the law was powerless to do, and that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son and the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin and sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the Spirit. Do you understand the significance of this? You see, by the gospel, by the cross of Jesus Christ, you are loved, no matter what people say to you. By the gospel, by the mercy of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven, no matter who harbors bitterness towards you. By the law and the power of what Christ accomplished, by fulfilling it, you are accepted, no matter who tries to charge you or condemn you. You begin to realize the power of the gospel is the power that transforms. It is the power of love. It's the power of love. In our world, very few people will die for anyone, right? We see some examples of people who are willing to die for others, and we're kind of moved by it, right? A law enforcement person who's willing to die for someone that maybe even despises him, and he's still willing, he or she's still willing to step in and, and do their duty and honor to protect life. We say, wow, that's pretty amazing. The military service member who's willing to go overseas and put their life in harm's way so that we can have our way of life here in America. And we say, that's compelling. Well, Jesus did it for the sins of the world. All the down and outs, all the not good enoughs, all those who couldn't do it by their own strength, which, by the way, is all of humanity. The risk this Easter season is to think that our own religious actions make us righteous. It's not true. You see, you are more graceful towards others when you know you need grace too, right? The church should be known as the fellowship of the forgiven. Wow, you see the difference there? The fellowship of the forgiven, inviting others to experience the peace that we've experienced knowing that our past can no longer define us. Our pains, our hurts, and our brokenness, our habits, and our addictions can no longer direct us or label us. In fact, someone once said that our destiny in Christ must now be what defines us. You're not defined by your brokenness anymore. Sorry. You're not defined by whatever addictions or habits or hurts you once had. That doesn't define you anymore. The only thing that has the authority to define you is the love and grace of Jesus Christ. Can I tell you some of the most hardened criminals? And as a police chaplain, I have the opportunity to hang out with some of them. It's very interesting, I tell you. Always a good time. Some of the most hardened criminals break down and cry when anyone shows them any measure of mercy. You see, because the world they live in, mercy gets you killed. Mercy gets you hurt, and mercy is weakness. But when someone in power and authority over them or has control or sway over them or someone they respect gives them mercy, shows them love, it undo, they are undone. It just melts them. They are blown away. Can I tell you that's a little closer to what Jesus meant about being blessed in the poor by a poor in spirit? Blessed that God loves us, that he'd be willing to die for us, to take our bad reputation on himself. Wow. So that we can have a new one by his mercy. That's powerful. And that's what we're going to explore this Easter season. Next week is sin and Easter morning, the morbid topic of death. Prepare yourself. Would you stand up? Let me pray for all of us. Father, thank you for this group. Thank you for everyone that you've brought together here. Thank you for the fact that we're not defined by 